it's again my honor to, to invite and to introduce here another great speaker of today. Uh, and this time it's Mark Streit, uh, who is a tenured full professor at the Johannes Kepler University Linz in Austria, where he also leads the Visual Data Science Lab. He finished his PhD at Graz University of Technology in 2011 and moved to Linz later that year. In 2012, he was a visiting researcher at the Harvard Medical School. As a part of a Fulbright scholarship for research and lecturing, he was a visiting professor at the Harvard Paulson School in 2014. Mark also teaches courses at the Imperial College Business School. His scientific areas of interest include visualization, visual analytics, and explainable machine learning. Together with his team and collaborators, he develops novel visual analysis tools for cancer research, drug discovery, and other application domains. He is a principal investigator and co-principal investigator in multiple research and industry projects. Mark won multiple best paper and runner-up awards at major conferences in his field. And he's not just a successful academic uh, researcher, but since 2016, he's also a CEO and co-founder of the uh, Johannes Kepler University spin-off company, DataVisim. So uh, Mark, we are very looking forward for your talk. Uh, once again, thanks a lot for inviting our, uh, accepting our invitation and we are very looking forward. So stage is yours. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for the very detailed <laughs> introduction. Um, first of all, congratulations to everyone who made this happen. So it's wonderfully organized um, summer school and the program is fabulous and it's really an honor to be part of it. And my talk is a bit off topic. So I, I actually work a lot with bio data, but um, this talk today is, is a bit off topic because many of the examples are not bio, but I included some of them. But according, according to Bara, uh, that should be fine. And it's a bit of a mix of uh, I will start lecture style and then we'll dive into our recent work. All right, so I divided my talk into basically three acts. Um, the first act, um, as I've said, it's a bit lecture style. I go into this problem, this curse of dimensionality, but in particular, how to use embeddings and projections um, in that kind of uh, context. And uh, Act 2 and Act 3 um, I, is, is then more centered around our recent work, so what we do um, in my group with, um, with embeddings and also, of course, with collaborators. All right, let's, let's dive into the first part, um, the role of embeddings in high-dimensional data. And I'm sure this is not new to uh, many of you. So embeddings and projections play a huge role nowadays in analyzing high dimensional data. Of course, it's, it's, complement, it's complemented with many different other techniques that we have available, um, like high dimensional visualization techniques. Um, but it's um, for, for many problems nowadays, it's uh, like a state of the art technique. And on the left-hand side, I just picked two examples here. On the left-hand side, you see an embedding of all books on Wikipedia, and you, you for instance, see that uh, different topics then nicely cluster. Um, and on the right-hand side, you see, for instance, how people use it for single cell data. In that case, it's uh, breast immune, immune cells that are projected, which means um, you, you see your data as feature vectors, and then you reduce the dimensionality into, uh, in that case, two dimensions. Uh, and of course, the goal is to reveal similarity and patterns in the data. So the closer two points are in the projection, in the embedding, which from a VIS point of view is nothing else than a scatter plot, of course, um, the more similar the points are. Um, and there is a really nice um, article that came out um, or, uh, three years ago already. Um, it's called The Beginner's Guide to Dimensionality Reduction. And it's a, it's a great introduction that I also use in, in, in uh, some of my courses. And the data set they had is um, 800 artwork, um, so a collection of 800 um, paintings in that case. And they nicely guide you through the pr process of dimensionality reduction. So in that case, um, for instance, they start with a, a math introduction. So basically, you have feature vectors. You see your items as feature vectors. And each um, property, like age, gender, or what you have, uh, depending on the data, uh, would then be um, represented in this feature vector. And then dimensionality reduction means that you reduce this 
um, this collection of dimensions to two or three D um, um, uh, length uh, vectors. And the data set can actually, this works with images, with words, um, um, also high dimensional uh, vectors from like single cell data and so on. So if you do that um, into 1D space, so projecting into 1D space, um, this is what you see on the right hand side. You take the artwork and um, you reduce it to one dimension, which just represents uh, dark and bright. So is the painting dark or is it uh, bright? And then you align your paintings um, along this axis. And here, um, the x-axis is just um, uh, uh, trying to avoid um, overlapping of images, but it has no meaning. It's, uh, it's just projecting into those two dimensions. And you see that you nicely see the structure going from bright to dark. If you do that with uh, in, into 2D, 2D space, this is what many people do. Um, then here, uh, it would also be very simple. It would be um, based on the image brightness. Um, and you also see that this is then uh, nicely clustering. So here on the left hand um, upper corner, you have the dark images, then um, you have uh, some red images and so on. Um, and I think this is also very popular nowadays. So the Google embedding projector, it was one of the first tools that, um, that came out um, to, to really nicely demonstrate what you can do. Uh, so it's part of the TensorFlow project. And here you can see an embedding of, of this MNIST data set where you have handwritten digits. And you see then that those handwritten digits, they nicely cluster. So for instance, you see you have all ones here. This is this arc here. You have all zeros here in blue and so on. And in terms of representation, so why is this interesting now for this? Uh, for this? Because you can think about how to work with uh, the different channels. And, and you've all heard the, the great introduction by Tamara. And um, basically, you can think of what visual channels can you manipulate? And of course, so for instance, um, here you could, uh, if you have categorical attributes, um, you could change the hue, you could change the shape of items. If you have an ordered attribute, like that could be a meta attribute that you want to visualize on top of the embedding. So for instance, that could be the class assignment. That would be a categorical um, uh, attribute. But you could also have ordered attributes, like. Um, if you would have paintings, it could be um, uh, when it was painted, right? Um, and that could be encoded using uh, the brightness or the saturation, for instance. And you also can pick other item representations like images or glyphs. And um, so just to, to mention some dimensionality reduction techniques that are used nowadays. So there are linear approaches like PCA or multidimensional scaling, but Nowadays, many people use nonlinear approaches like uh, TSNE, UMAP, um, uh, and, and uh, not so much self-organizing maps. So I think the predominant ones are uh, TSNE and UMAP nowadays. And there is also um, a really good article if you want to um, go through examples and see how TSNE works effectively, um, then I, I can highly recommend this resource and it demonstrates that there are hyperparameters that really matter. So there is no one good embedding, right? It always depends on hyperparameters. You need to be really careful because cluster size. So if, if you have items that cluster, that can mean nothing because it can be an artifact of the projection. Distances between clusters uh, might not mean a lot. And you could have random noise also uh, that does not look random. There's another article for UMAP, which is, which is really nice. Um, I just left it in there as a reference. I will also, um, the talk will be uh, um, available as a recording, but I will also uh, make a tweet about it. Um, and here you can see, for instance, how UMAP works. On the left-hand side, you see original 3D data. You see this uh, woolly mammoth, um, uh, mammoth. And on the right-hand side, you can then check out what UMAP does and which kind of patterns it preserves. It's, it's really lovely example. And also part of this article, um, so th that's, that's a survey article that compares different projection or embedding techniques. And you, you can really see that with the same data, you see different patterns and different structure. But uh, you need to be careful when interpreting them. So there, there's also many things that can go wrong. This concludes the first part. 
Now I want to go to um, the second part, which is talking about embedding based trajectories. What do I mean by that? So there was a, and I, I will make back this, this uh, connection to embeddings later on. So there was a really powerful technique, I think, published by Benjamin Bach, uh, Bach and, and colleagues a couple of years ago. Um, it's called the time curve technique. And time curve, it means that you have, um, uh, that you have, you could have sequential data, like temporal data. And you, uh, if you see that as a sequence, you have that here at the top, and then you fold the curve according to the similarity of the data items, right? So it means here, uh, the more similar the color is, the more similar the, are the data items. And you can see then that uh, this three and six um, time point in your data is then coming closer to each other because it's more similar. So this is how to interpret this time curve technique. And um, Benjamin um, uh, also created these, these really nice cheat sheets. And, and I, I can also recommend this as a, as a resource. And time curve is part of this uh, cheat sheet collection. And there, there are many other cheat sheets that are relevant for visualization. Um, and that would be the example for time curve. So the, the idea behind cheat sheets is to, to, um, to introduce one particular topic, uh, a vis relevant topic, uh, in a very nice, um, sometimes comic-like uh, style, uh, and it introduces the most important parts. Um, and you have, so this would be an example how time curve is, um, how the time curve technique is applied to real world data. And what you see um, here is a video stream consisting of multiple images, right? But it could also be like medical images. Um, it, it would work the same way. Um, but you have a surveillance video. And you see that most of the images, they cluster in the center because there is nothing going on, right? It's just night and no one walks across the street. But if something happens, you see that the point moves further away because it's pushed away in the projection um, and you also see that, for instance, you have another point here. And then uh, at some point, if the, the person moves out of the image again, uh, then you're back here. And this is nice because it nicely preserves the temporal order. Okay, And this means you have trajectories going through the space. That would be another data set uh, with global temperature evolution between 1884 and 2012. And you see, um, if, if the points deviate a lot, it means that a lot, of, a lot of things have happened in the data, the more similar, the dissimilar the data points are. And that's the final example that I like a lot from, from their paper. It's uh, the time curve technique applied to different Wikipedia articles. And you see, for instance, if you have edit wars, like for abortion, there are a couple of people editing this back and forth. And this is nicely preserved in this um, embedding. And what I also uh, think it's great if you if you publish a technique, then it's it's uh, one important building block of this is to generalize the patterns in order to make it usable for others. And this is also what they have nicely done in their work. For instance, um, what does it mean if you see a cluster? What does it mean if you see cycles, U-turns, and so on? So I think this is a very strong aspect um, of every um, technique paper in this case. And now. I want to show you, so we got inspired by these time curves and, and we thought about how can we apply it to, uh, at that point in time, we, we were thinking of a demonstrator for an open house day. And uh, a bachelor student was uh, on this project and his goal was then um, to create a visualization of how people solve Rubik's cubes. And I'm sure many of you have solved the Rubik's cube uh, before or tried to solve it. I don't know how successful you were. and um, there are actually competitions, and um, here you see the world record attempt of this guy. I will try to play the video. Um, and you see, um, so you get a scrambled state. Everyone gets the same scrambled cube. You can look at it, and then you have to put your hands down, and then you have to solve it. And the world record is 4.22 seconds, which is like crazy if you think of it. Um, if you do it in one hour, that would be considered as, as, as good with your friends, right? Um, and then here below, you can see how a machine solves it. And I will replay the video. And they actually had to recreate this, this cube and, and pick a different one. 
um, because it would have been destroyed because it's solved in 0 0.38 seconds, right? But the question is, what do you need to do to solve it? And this was the task the, the bachelor student took on. And here on the left-hand side, you see the beginner's method. So it's an embedding that takes the states. Um, and this is the beginner's method on the left-hand side and the Friedrich method on the right-hand side. And I will now explain how to get to this. And I will also show you some examples which are then more serious. So if you take a Rubik's cube, you can virtually unfold it, every state, right? See it as a, a feature vector that you then project into 2D space and you connect them using a line. If you do that for one cube, it will look like this. And if you do it for 100 cubes, it will look like that. And you see that you have those curls appear. And this is where you have to do multiple operations in order to move one brick from uh, one part to the next. So if you've done that, um, you, you might remember it. And here you see it again. So you have a series of Rubik's cube states. Uh, you see it as a feature vector that you project into 2D space. And you have then this trajectory going through the space. And this is. Um, this, these are two different algorithms here that are color coded, the beginner's method and the more advanced Friedrich method. And you see that, so this is the scrambled Rubik's cube. And then you see that they share the same path. And at some point they deviate because the solution uh, is different. And one is more uh, effective than the other one. So the beginner's method, it needs more rotations in order to get the job done. Um, what you see now here in, in this example, um, is, for instance, this huge cluster here is all beginner, uh, is all scrambled states, which makes sense that they are distributed all over the place because they are very different from each other. Here, this cluster is actually the final solved state. And you see that that cluster here is actually almost solved states. There is one brick missing. And the interesting thing is that you have to do with the beginner's method, you have to do crazy rotations in order to get the last bit done, which is uh, awesome. And for the Friedrich method, you see that it's more efficient and you only have to go along this loop. And what came out actually is a, is a nice tool that uh, if, if we have time, I can demonstrate it at the end. It's an interactive tool you can uh, play with. Uh, we call it the Projection Space Explorer. And you can change the color coding. You can upload your own data. You can reproject your data. Um, and you can uh, explore it. Now, the, the student, which I found great, um, uh, together with, with another student, actually, they, they created this demo for the open house day. So we had a monitor that shows this embedding and where you are. And uh, there was actually a Lego Mindstorm solver that was able to solve it. So you can scramble it and put it in the Lego Mindstorm solver and see in the projection where you're going. And uh, the student even implemented, so, so we ordered a, a Bluetooth connected Rubik's cube where you can read the state um, with on your computer. And then he created a multiplayer game where two opponents could play against each other. And you see them in the projection. So here you can see it was an early state. Um, you see in the projection where you are and it's making suggestions what you should do next. So there was a solver running in the background. Um, and now, I'm, I'm trying to get more serious. So uh, we applied it, for instance, to sorting algorithms. You can, you can apply the same technique basically to everything that has a sequence between states that you project. And, and you see nice patterns appear if you, if you look at different alg algorithms. And I'm, I'm not going into details here, but you see that bubble sort looks very different um, um, uh, compared to quick sort. And, and this, I think, is also super important. It will, again, look very different if you apply different embedding, uh, different projection techniques. And, and this is, so there is no one valid uh, projection. You can try out multiple things, and then um, you will see different structure. Um, and this is maybe something for Helwig and, and others who play chess. Um, we applied it to chess data. And, and um, this is also interesting what you see there. For instance, you see that. Um, that you have different openings, like the sucker tort opening and the queen's pawn opening. That should be um, that should be d4 here. Um, uh, that's a mistake. Um, but you see, you have 
this is the, the start of the game. And these are professional games. So from professional players. And you see there are two predominant openings, at least in the subset we took. And then you see that they split up and go along different parts in the projection. And for instance, you have final end game states here. You have castling moves here in, in B and C. Um, and, and you have, um, uh, what else do we have? Uh, there is a pawn defense. I think the states are here uh, in D. And again, be careful because if you apply, for instance, a different parameterization of TSNI, the result will look very different. Okay, so it's, it's really um, exploration technique in this case, and you need to be careful what you're seeing and how you interpret it. Um, there are also um, other colleagues, like in that case, uh, Rauba uh, from, from Alex Telea's group in this case, they used a, a similar idea, you project states of, uh, of, um, um, uh, of a neural network that is solved over multiple epochs. And every instance is shown here as a trajectory. And you see that over time, so the epochs are moving um, basically to the outside. And you see that the items nicely spread in the space. And then in the end, they cover, um, they cover um, the space. So uh, I think it's, it's, it's really general how you can use these kind of trajectories. Uh, we also tried something um, in, in, in our own groups. So for instance, with neural networks, we, we took, um, we took um, uh, confusion matrices and projected them. And you see then how close you get to the perfect classification in this example, which is the star here. And you see that there are two, um, two training runs that are really getting close to the perfect, uh, to the perfect um, uh, state. And we also, um, so th this is uh, work by Connie Walchsofer. She's a PhD student in my group. And we also try to apply this to provenance data. So what people do in your tools and think of uh, basically every trajectory is, uh, is, a, is a user session. And then you see really interesting patterns appear. For instance, there is, uh, we applied that to Gapminder. Um, so uh, people were using Gapminder and you see then for instance, a time arc appear. So where people change the time slider in Gapminder and you see that they touch this time arc um, at different points in the session. And uh, we now also try it with, with our collaborators from pharmaceutical industry to really look at their sessions in, in, uh, in this way. And you also see that, um, that you, you can, for instance, compare a force directed layout with embedding driven layout, and you will see very different patterns. And now, as I'm already done with my time, I want to show you a, a, a very last example. Um, I think it takes uh, three more minutes. And here, the, the goal, uh, and this is Klaus' work. So Klaus, uh, I don't know if he's here, but he was yesterday. And uh, I remember in my, uh, when I was a PhD student and my supervisor presented my work, I was always like, oh, I don't know, it's kind of that, but not really. <laughs> so I will do my best. Um, so if you, uh, so the, the question was then, you can explore that and we made an interactive tool for that. But what do you want to do if you want to tell a story with the embeddings? And if you have additional structure, like you have clusters, you have relationships between clusters, um, you have, um, you could have hi hierarchies. So I, I've indicated that here, you could have groups that you want to explore. You could have hierarchical relationships. You could have sequences between groups and um, you could name many different examples where you have this kind of structure on top of your embedding. And the question is how to explore that. And first you have to look at how to visualize this structure in an embedding. So for instance, um, sequences, that's easy. You just connect them using lines, right? If you have items belonging to groups, well, you could visualize it in this way. If you have one group that contains many items, you could visualize it in that way. And if you have a group um, of items, you could, for instance, use contours. And um, then you have to think about how to represent summaries of states and differences between states. And I have multiple examples. So here you have high dimensional data, then you could 
compare your data with histograms. You could compare your data um, with, with box plots, for instance. And that very much depends on the use case. So if you have, um, if you have uh, chess, um, then of course you can use the chess board and you can indicate um, you can indicate using these highlights what happens on the chessboard. If you have a Rubik's cube, you could also indicate that um, if you have a chemical structure. So we're also using that with Bayer, for instance. You can uh, you can use the maximum common substructure to visualize what's the difference. And this is then used. Um, and I want to show you that uh, it's then used in this way that the user can create clusters in the projection and you connect those clusters and then you want to find out what's going on between the clusters. And you can use that as a storytelling tool on the right hand side. So if there is a question, I can also show a short video later on. And you will see what's happening in the projection between those clusters and what's going on. And for this, you need this summary and difference visualization. So here is the summary of the states and here is the difference. And then you can try to go through um, your projections and try to use storytelling for explaining what's going on in your projection. Yes, and we also applied it to gene expression data and that's what we currently do also with uh, Beringer Ingelheim, uh, where we try to explore it uh, and apply it to real world data. Now it's time to thank many people who contributed to this work and who paid for this work. So <laughs> thanks to everyone. Um, that's a great team effort. And this brings me to the end. Thanks for your attention. I hope it was interesting and I'm looking forward to some final questions. Thank you, Mark. It was amazing. <laughs> it was really great. And always seeing the, the Rubik's Cube <laughs> assembled so fast, it's very embarrassing. <laughs> uh, so we are having a couple of questions, of course, as always. So I started with, I started with one from Hamid. How about to obtain embedding first with neural nets, e.g. autoencoders, and then use it for TSNI, UMAP, and so on? Yes, there is definitely work on that. Um, also, uh, th so that's an excellent question. How to be more clever with creating the embeddings? And uh, so this is what you can do uh, with, with autoencoders. Um, and, and now we also, for instance, for the chess um, that you see here again, uh, we are we're collaborating with a colleague, uh, a professor here at JKU, who is actually a professional chess player. And, and we're also looking into, so he does the interpretation because uh, we would do a very poor job, but we are also taking the latent space. So one of the last layers of a network and project this. So you, you have, for instance, uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, like a, um, a machine, uh, an algorithm that plays chess very well and that is trained with, uh, with, with hundred thousands of games. And then you take the last layers of that and you project those last layers and you use this then for projection. So uh, it's a really good question. You need to be clever about how to get to a good embedding that is also closely preserving some semantics that you're interested in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we are having a question from Helwighauser. Uh, working with 2D embeddings is kind of risky when the intrinsic dimensionality is larger than two. Will you still do it? The significant variability of different 2D embeddings can be a consequence of the intrinsic dimensionality not being two or close to two. Uh, I'd be ready to have hypothesized that uh, some of the examples that you showed actually have clearly higher intrinsic dimensionality. Yes, I, I, so that's a very valid question. And I do think that that all interpretations you do need to be handled with care. And that's why I, I, I'm, so even if you see artifacts, which, is, uh, which can be the case in, in many cases, I think exploration can do a lot with um, interpreting and detecting those artifacts. Um, but I do agree that it can be harmful if you give it into the hands of I don't know, a biologist or a doctor who, who is not aware of these limitations of the embeddings. But that's a super relevant point. Mm -hmm. um, but there is also interesting work that looks at the validity um, of embeddings and tries to express that and the quality of embeddings. So that, that there is also an interesting subfield of research here. Yeah, yeah. And Helvig is actually another question. Can you show the bone cloud opening in your embedding, please? <laughs> And you also put the, the reference uh, here on Discord, uh, but 
probably you cannot see it now, but you can check it later. <laughs> so which opening? Bond cloud opening. Oh, I, so the, the only um, in the subset we downloaded, so it's a subset of this uh, professional game platform. There were actually three and those were the only ones, uh -huh. the Sucre port, the English opening and the Queen's pawn opening. Um, and, 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 and now with, with Johannes Fürnkranz, this professional player, we're really looking into opening strategies. Like there is this closed games versus open games and, and the, the pawn game is, is really important at the beginning, uh, I've learned. But I'm happy to have a discussion with Helwig about what can be seen and what cannot be seen. Of course, it's, it's always super interesting to talk with actual users or chess players in this case. Um, yeah. yeah, I think he's great for that with <laughs> experience in chess playing. So yes. Helvig, uh, you have some uh, partner for discussion afterwards. Uh, there are still some questions, but I think we are running out of time already. So Mark, thanks a lot once again for this great talk. I really enjoyed it a lot. And if you will still have a bit of time to join us on Discord and maybe answer some more, it will be great. So thanks a lot. Yeah, I will do that. Thank, Thank you. you.